Aloha and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kaylee Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. Well, anyone who's been watching our show knows that Grassroot Institute ends up in the news from time to time, whether we're giving commentary or whether we're the subject of the news. But today we're going to flip the table around, and I'm going to be talking to one of the journalists who covers us and many, many other things here in Honolulu. And we're going to talk a little bit about the profession of journalism here in Hawaii and what millennials are bringing to the table. My guest today is a brilliant lady who started off her career as a graduate of Harvard University, ended up at the Wall Street Journal, and then took a promotion to Honolulu Civil Beat. So please welcome to the program Civil Beat journalist Anita Hofschneider. Anita, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm so glad you're here. I know your medium is usually in the written form, but today you get to do something on broadcast television. Have you done much of that yet? Um, a little bit. I've done some short segments on KITV, but for the most part, I like to stay uh, behind the camera, not in front of it. <laughs> well, you know, I've been dying to ask you, as you finished up at Harvard and then got that great position at the Wall Street Journal, what is it that led you to come to Hawaii, of all places? Um, well, actually, right after college, I got an internship at Honolulu Civil Beat. Oh, you did a little yeah. bit of time here. Yes, and then I got a temporary job uh, covering the legislature for the Associated Press, and it was after that that I took a summer internship at the Wall Street Journal in New York. Um, so it was when I was at New York that Civil Beat called me up and asked me to come back and work full time. Well, that's great. Now, you're not originally from Hawaii, but you decided to come back to Hawaii. And, you know, just to set you at ease, today's story is not about some heavy issue or investigative research that you're doing. We're talking about Anita. So <laughs> I'm very, very interested in knowing what your uh, reasons are for being in the profession of journalism. Why, why did you decide to settle both for, in Hawaii and in journalism? Well, I think coming out of college, I was interested in journalism, but I wasn't sure um, if, if I could make it work. That's because a lot of young journalists have to start off with unpaid internships, and that sure. wasn't something that I could afford. Um, I got really lucky, and Civil Beat offered to give me a, an internship through the Society of Professional Journalists. The SPJ program locally um, helps fund uh, summer internships every year. And so I um, was interested in coming to Hawaii because I'm from Saipan, which is an island next to Guam in the Marianas. Right, and, and I want to clarify for our viewers mm -hmm. that Anita is actually, as she said, not from Hawaii, but you're from another island paradise, <laughs> Saipan. Yes, it's it's similar. It's much hotter. It's it's a only only about 50,000 people there, so it's it's about the size of population of Kauai. Um, and I have family here. One of my sisters lived here, and my parents both went to school here at UH, and so I had a, a connection. And I the good opportunity at Civil Beat was just too good to pass up. Well, one of the things we recently wrote a study on at the Grassroot Institute was the fact that there is a brain drain from Hawaii uh, at every level, whether we're talking about people who work in manual professions or people who work in uh, journalism as well. Uh, in fact, a famous journalist who, whom we were following closely just left Hawaii for another position. People are finding that it's hard to live here because of the cost of living. But you decided to come into Hawaii, uh, and uh, you know, despite the fact that so many millennials are leaving for their careers, what, what attracts you to Hawaii? Well, I think that um, I do agree with you that there is a brain drain. For example, one of my colleagues, um, Alia Wong, grew up in Hawaii, went to Punahou, and she worked at Civil Beat for a couple of years, but then she went off to D.C. to work at The Atlantic. So it is a, a huge loss of talent, but um, also you know, a good opportunity for other people to get um, some training and some experience. I think in my case, because I didn't grow up in Hawaii, I'm still learning a lot about the culture and the people and the issues here. And I find it very fascinating because they are similar to issues at home, where a lot of the debates are kind of at the intersection of economic concerns environmental concerns and indigenous people concerns um, and so I when I got the opportunity to go to Civil Beat I decided that it was a good fit for my interests and that it could be a place where I could be challenged and learn and grow. So uh, what do you think the prospects are for establishing a good journalistic career here in Hawaii? I definitely think it can be challenging because there are such limited positions, mm -hmm. and I do think that the cost of living is a huge challenge. You know, journalism positions don't pay that well, 
and it's you know when you're paying a lot for rent or for food, um, it definitely makes you question whether or not this is a sustainable uh, industry. But I think that there are so many great issues to cover here. People think of Hawaii on the mainland, think of Hawaii as a paradise, but as you know, the issues are so much more complicated than people realize. And so, I think there is opportunity to do really great journalism, um, from investigative journalism to explanatory journalism to feature journalism. It's all here. Well, millennials are no doubt about it shaping all professions today, and in particular, journalism. Uh, I think one reason may be because of the use of technology. What are your thoughts on that? I would agree. I think that a lot of people nowadays, they get their news from reading on their phones, reading Facebook, and so it definitely challenges news organizations to think more broadly about how they can reach those uh, readers and how they can change headlines, for example, to make sure that they are um, attractive on social media and that people click on them and, and share them. And so I, I do think that it's changing how uh, the news industry thinks about a new, how news should be distributed. You're talking about headlines, you're talking about clicking on those headlines. That's a different kind of language than what is talked about at the Wall Street Journal, for ex example, where headlines pretty much look the same and articles are long and analytical and so forth. Uh, how does reading news on a, a, a little telephone impact the content of that news? Well, I can say that at Civil Beat, we, you know, we have a very particular mission, which is to write about public policy mm -hmm. issues in Hawaii. And so even though we know that maybe not everybody is interested in reading about public records law or unfunded <laughs> liabilities, we don't let that stop us from writing about it. But I think that what we do think differently is about how to portray that news. For example, often thinking about ways to use video or graphics, um, you know, interactives, like animations, for example, to try to convey news differently in a way that will uh, keep people's interests. Well, Civil Beat is a dedicated online newspaper which is different from the Honolulu Star Advertiser, the big paper in our town that comes from uh, uh, print media background and so forth, and they're going through a transition. So you may not have some of the kinds of transitional issues. You definitely don't at Civil Beat. But a lot of times people learn about professions from the from fiction. For example, are you familiar with House, House of Cards? Uh, yes, I've seen a couple of episodes. Well, House of Cards features uh, in its first episode, first season, a newspaper that's print-based, but has some online blogging. And there's this battle between the editor and one of the reporters, uh, Zoe Barnes, over the future of news media. And there's this contest between what, what can be done in print media and what can be done, as she believes, with greater, uh, I mean, with greater effect through the blogging. What are your thoughts about that and the future of news media? Um, well, to be honest, I wasn't a huge fan of, of House of Cards, um, but I do think that that tension over, you know, that, that tension is likely present within uh, many newspapers nowadays who are, that are trying to figure out, uh, you know, how much of their effort to put into their website versus to maintain in their print product, and, and how, for example, how much of their marketing effort should be spent online versus, uh, you know, focused on just ads in the paper. And so, yeah. Having worked at the Wall Street Journal, which is both online and in print, what are your thoughts about the future of print media here in Hawaii? Well, I have to say that the layoffs that happened at the Star Advertiser uh -huh. last, some, last fall um, were definitely concerning because as a, a Monopoly newspaper, you'd expect that they, or at least I expected that they were doing quite well financially, but I realized at the time that they actually have been hit by a lot of the advertising losses that are affecting newspapers nationally. So it was the first time that I realized that there's a possibility that Hawaii could have no print newspaper in the future if, um, you know, the if the market doesn't improve and if subscribers don't make an effort to actually uh, pay for news. And so I would encourage everybody who wants to read quality news to and read quality local news to support your local newspaper or nonprofits like Civil Beat or whatever organizations you feel are providing the types of news that you value. Now, you referred to the Honolulu Star Advertiser as a monopoly paper. You're talking about the fact that we don't have a great deal of competition in the news media market here, at least in print and newspapers and so forth. What, what do you see in terms of the role that Civil Beat plays in, in this market? 
You know, Civil Beat came online right um, around the same time that the uh, you know, the Hawaii changed from having two main newspapers to just one. And so I think that the organization has always seen itself as trying to provide an alternative voice, um, trying to uh, provide in-depth news or news that uh, is uh, different news that is, may not be covered elsewhere. And so we're always, uh, you know, reevaluating our, um, you know, what we're covering and trying to figure out what we can do better. But we definitely see ourselves as uh, really trying to help improve the quality of news in Hawaii. You know, the Civil Beat uh, being an online paper uh, allows more in-depth coverage of a great many topics. Uh, wh what kinds of uh, articles have you really enjoyed working on? Well, I've been lucky enough to uh, write about a variety of different topics. I recently covered the state legislature and wrote about the, um, you know, the debate over how to fund Honolulu Rail. And, and that was uh, very interesting and, and very fast-paced. Well, you know, rail has played such a significant centerpiece of our political discourse here in Honolulu and in the entire state. And it has gone from pro-rail versus anti-rail. What, what, what do you see in terms of being the real issues facing the rail today? I think that an issue that many of the lawmakers uh, seemed concerned about was the question of transparency. There seems to be a lot of disillusionment with the city and the, um, the estimates that they provided about how mu much rail will cost. And so the legislators were saying that they want more clarity on how much the project will cost overall before they um, decide to help the city fund it. You know, that's an interesting point because uh, if one were to just go back four years or so when politicians were campaigning frequently on their signs, uh, they, they would put a little bumper sticker, pro-rail or anti-rail, almost as a litmus test in their, in, their, in their districts in order to win the constituency. But you're suggesting that the general public is moving away from this pro-rail, anti-rail divide and into issues that are usually boring issues, government transparency, the use of funds, and so forth. Uh, how do you see that taking, do you see that taking place, and, and what, what tells you that's taking place? Well, I do think that people still have very strong opinions. Mm -hmm. You know, they, some people still want to tear the project down. Some people wish it hadn't gotten started, and other people think it should be built at any cost. So I don't think that people are less partisan on the issue, um, but I do hear from uh, lawmakers that transparency is important and that, and you know, they wish that there was more of it. And at least, um, and I, I know that the city uh, says that they've been doing their best to provide uh, accurate numbers, but it is challenging on a project of this uh, scope and, you know, a project that's with so many different moving parts. Well, I'm sure then the financial side of it has given a lot for you to write about. When we come back after this short break, I'd like to ask you about some of the other articles that you've written and the unique perspectives you've had. My guest today is Civil Beat journalist Anita Hofschneider, and we'll be right back after this short break. I'm Kaylee Akina on Think Tech Hawaii's Ehana Kako. Don't go away. Aloha again, and I'm so glad you're watching Think Tech Hawaii's Ehana Kako, sponsored with the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. But I do want to tip my hat to Think Tech Hawaii and their wonderful team of staff and volunteers who put about 35 hours of original content onto the air, emanating from Honolulu and going out across the world. And you can see that content at thinktechhawaii.com. At the Grassroot Institute, we say Ehana Kako, which sounds like a venerable Hawaiian saying, a 
pule kako. You can go to public events here, and there will be somebody at the beginning who will give an invocation that says, a pule kako, let's pray together. Well, at the Grassroot Institute, we like to say, let's work together. Let's work together to build a better economy, government, and society. And today, uh, we're talking with a journalist who is also involved in building a better economy, government, and society, but from a, a different angle, uh, not making the news so much as reporting and discussing the news. And I'm with Anita Hofschneider. We've had a fascinating first half of our program talking about the impact millennials are having on this profession and why she's decided to work in Hawaii rather than pursuing her career on the mainland. But now I'd like to talk to her a little bit about some of the stories that you've covered. Anita, uh, you actually are from Mariana Islands, the Mariana Islands. <laughs> yes. Or Marianas sometimes, as it's called. And you've had the privilege of covering some of the goings on there, particularly involving the military. Yes, I was lucky enough last year um, to fly out to Guam and to the islands of Saipan and Tinian to write about uh, plans to expand military training out there in response to um, you know some concerns about. Well, basically, it was part of the Obama administration's efforts to uh, rebalance to Asia and, and focus their, the military there, but also in response to concerns in Okinawa about the presence of troops. And so uh, there are about 5,000 Marines that are going to be relocated to Guam. So we had concerns, of course, uh, in Korea, I mean, actually in Okinawa, regarding the military base there, and they're moving to Mariana. What did you discover in the local reactions? Were there interest groups that are similar to the kinds of interest groups we have here in the Hawaiian Islands? Yes, it's very similar, and that's one of the reasons why I was interested in writing about it for Civil Beat, because you know in Hawaii there is, as you know, a large military presence, and there are um, the training that they do does raise some environmental issues or concerns about uh, indigenous rights, um, as well as you know, economic concerns, and those were the same types of issues that were being discussed in the Marianas. So you must have different constituencies or interest groups around each of those those interests. The indigenous, the environmentalist, the military, the economic? Yes. And, you know, in Guam, I found that most people were supportive of the military buildup because of it, the economic benefit that they would receive. But in some of the smaller islands, um, especially on the small island of Tinian, which is about half the population of Molokai, um, people were very concerned about the uh, potential for environmental degre degradation, how that would affect their tourism industry, and how that would affect some of their um, indigenous artifacts. What did you learn from covering these distinct interest groups in Mariana that you can transfer to covering those similar interest groups here in Hawaii? Well, these definitely seem to be uh, very similar values that they held um, to different, as they held similar values, uh, in, similar interest groups in Hawaii. For example, uh, the environmental activists who were concerned about the impact of uh, bombing practice, um, they ended up teaming up with Earth Justice in Honolulu. And so Earth Justice in Honolulu filed a lawsuit to try to stop the Navy from moving forward with its plans. Um, and so in a lot of ways, even though these islands are quite far away from Hawaii, um, they're very intertwined with what's happening here. Now that's very interesting. There, there was sympathy here in Hawaii for what was going on in Mariana. And it happened on the environmental level you mentioned. Did it happen on the indigenous peoples level as well, or, or economic level as well? Well, there, are, you know, actually, in terms of the military presence here in yes. Hawaii, there are some uh, top officials here who were, or have been heavily involved in expanding training in the Marianas. And so, for some of my interviews, I was able to do them locally because they were with officials um, who were staying at Pearl Harbor um, or on Hickam, for example. And so. Uh, they definitely. It was interesting to see to how what a great influence that uh, these officials had on what was happening in the Marianas, even though they're out here in Honolulu. Do you ever find yourself rooting for one side, mm -hmm. something which you can't really let let out in your your actual written work? Uh, does that does that happen? Well, it was. Definitely a different story to do because I'm from the Marianas, right. and so I was talking to people who, uh, some of whom I had known before I became a journalist, um, and I, I empathized with their desire to try to protect their home and you know their concerns about the military mm -hmm. plans. But I also 
empathized with the perspective that you know these plans were necessary to protect national security or that they would be very important for the economy and so I think that you know in this job whenever I feel as if I'm sympathizing too much with one side I generally just talk to the other side and and through that process of sifting through information and learning about everybody's different opinions it's a good way to make, make sure that um, any opinion I might have is moderated and that I um, you know I'm really keeping um, my pulse on the, the broader picture rather than um, you know focusing too much on what one perspective is saying. And that's very important from a professional point of view in, in terms of making sure that your craft is not co-opted by feelings that are subjective and so forth. Do you have a different perspective when you cover these things from uh, a, the older generation of journalists? For example, I've interviewed uh, some of the old fogies like uh, Chad Blair, my dear friend, <laughs> here on the program. And uh, you, you bring a younger millennial perspective on covering issues. Uh, do you detect any, any differences in what you may cover? Um, you know, all I can say is that I aspire to be as um, <laughs> accomplished as Chad in, in terms of his journalism. <laughs> and I, I know there's definitely a push in uh, some areas of journalism to include more of your opinion on um, your personal feelings and what you're writing. Uh, I don't think that that's what we've been doing at Civil Beat. You know, we, we do try to um, you know, go beyond he said, she said journalism, but we definitely stick to, at least for me, I, I try to stick to uh, facts and not, you know, inject my personal opinion in the articles that I write. Well, let's keep talking about special interest groups and constituencies and come back to Hawaii. You also did a little bit of coverage of the Mauna Kea uh, episodes that we, we've gone through, especially at the beginning stages of the protests on the Mauna. Uh, what did you see in common with some of the constituencies that you covered in Mariana? There was a lot that was in common, I, I felt. Um, you know, you had very, very passionate activists, many of whom were young, who were concerned about how building the 30-meter telescope uh, would affect a, a mountain that they consider sacred. Um, you also had environmentalists who were concerned about, you know, the impact that the telescope would have on endangered species. And you have uh, people who say it's important for the Big Island's economy. I mean, there, it, you know, the 30-meter telescope has offered to give money that would go to education, and so there are definitely Big Island residents who say that that would be a worthy cause, and that they, the telescope is a small price to pay for that. Now, you've covered groups that sometimes are, are lumped together. T take, for example, Native Hawaiians, uh, but you've discovered that they may not necessarily all have the same viewpoints. That's right. I think that it's easy, you know, when you're writing an article and that you don't have a lot of space to uh, portray um, issues as black and white, but it's definitely a trap that I try not to fall into because they're, it, you're correct, they're, Native Hawaiians are diverse people and they have diverse opinions. And so um, it's definitely a more complicated issue and to say what their perspective is. Um, you know, you're always portraying what certain people's perspective is and not necessarily the entire community. You know, I, I get very frustrated when I watch television news, which has to be condensed even more th than internet news or, or written news, because you're, you may have only 90 seconds to do a report and an update on Mauna Kea on a 6.30 news show. And sometimes they'll bring in just one person representing a certain side, perhaps a native Hawaiian who says something. And then the impression given is that that represents the entire constituency. You're saying that journalism needs to bring out the, the fuller picture. I mean, as much as possible. I, I do understand that television journalists have time constraints, and there's not much you can do about that. But um, I, it is important to try to find a bigger picture. And I'd recommend listening to Civil Beat's podcast, Offshore. The second season um, is looking at the issue of Mauna Kea and um, trying to do an, uh, do an in-depth look at the issue um, over several hours of audio listening rather than um, you know the, the type of uh, coverage you would get in a short news article or even a short radio piece. Now, your offshore podcasts sound like uh, public radio, actually. In fact, do they, are, are they broadcast on public radio? Um, yes, I believe the first season is being broadcast. And I should say, I'm not actually involved in the production of Offshore. Um, that's the good work of my colleagues, Jessica Terrell and April Esterlin. 
um, but they've been working really hard. And the first season was about, um, you know, was about a death in Waikiki. It was about the death of Colin Elderts at the hands of Christopher mm -hmm. Didi. And so it talked about right. race issues in Hawaii. And the second season is about um, the debate over whether or not the TMT should be built on Mauna Kea. Uh, I really liked the Christopher Didi uh, programming that was put together be because it took time. It was lengthy. I mean, if one wasn't interested, it would have seemed boring. <laughs> but but it, I found it very fascinating that the, the program took pains to draw out the stories of the different constituencies as dispassionately as they possibly could. It sounds like that's something you want to do. Just for a minute before we close today, any thoughts about your, rec your coverage of the recent legislative session? Anything else that struck you as a journalist trying to be the fourth estate, keeping a watch under the hand of government? Um, well, I thought that it was very surprising to me, and I'm sure it was to many onlookers, that they, the lawmakers didn't come to a decision about how to fund the rail system. And um, you know, many other bills also fell by the wayside. And so as the lawmakers consider whether or not to come back for a special session, I, I think it'll be important for journalists like myself and others um, to keep track of what's going on, even though there's no official public hearings to attend. Um, there's still a lot, I'm sure, that's happening uh, behind the scenes. And so it's it's the issue is far from over. Well, we have a, about a minute left, and I, I know you have been covering affordable housing, which is such a significant issue here in Hawaii. W what do you think you've been contributing through your, your coverage of that as a journalist? I think what I've tried to do is help people understand why the cost of living here is so high, um, you know, why homes are so expensive. It doesn't make sense to a lot of people why a million dollar house would be so small and, and uh, you know, not, not really look as fancy as you'd expect a home of that price to be. Uh, but it has a lot to do with the, the lack of affordable housing here in Hawaii and the short supply really drives up the prices of homes and also the demand from both uh, in state but also out of state and out of the country. Well, there's a basic economic principle of supply and demand there. What do you think journalism could contribute to, to changing the availability of housing? That's a big question, but uh, you can answer it in a general way. Yeah, I think that uh, we can just keep talking to people about what potential solutions are and keep writing about those solutions. Well, very good. Well, Anita, I've enjoyed talking with you today, and I hope you've enjoyed sharing a little bit about your experiences and your profession. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you. My guest today has been Anita Schneider, who, Hofschneider, Anita Hofschneider, who is a journalist with Honolulu Civil Beat. We wish her well and see that she's building our journalistic profession here in the islands. I'm Kili'i Akina with Grassroot Institute, and we'll be back again next week on Ehana Kako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Until then, aloha.